And welcome back to Inside the Labyrinth Podcast. It is your co-host, the real Jumpman Jay, and I'm here with my boy, Frankie V. Bring him in. How are we doing? We're back. And uh, a little congratulations to us, I guess, Jay. We finished season three, and this is the start of season four. Uh, yeah. What's that? Tw- 21 episodes down, and uh, just the amount of amount of stories we've heard from you know, the best people in their craft, I would say. And it was just, you know, an honor to, to share this experience with you, my brother. So yeah, thank man, you. This has uh, been a roller coaster ride. I'm very grateful to be a part of the process. I'm very, very, very excited for today because most of you know I'm an avid crossfitter. Um, and um, this guest is somebody that uh, very, is very comparable to, like, body size. So when I first started crossfit, I, I was looking for guys that kind of had the same frame that I had. I'm about 5'11", about 210 pounds, and uh, came across uh, ESPN one night, right? and I see these guys just going at it. It's like 2012, and our guest happens to come across the screen. Like, he kind of looks like me. He looks like a little bit more buff than I, but he made <laughs> me think that I could, I could potentially be good at this sport, and uh, he's one of the main reasons why I jumped in. Um, so I'm very excited when Frankie's here. That he solidified his guest. Said, "All right, man, I got to bring my A game today." So, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna have uh, Frankie bring in our guest because that's what he normally does. Oh, uh, you sure you want me to bring him in, or you want to bring him in? You know what? Can, you're, you're, can I do it bring this him time in. around? Go ahead, man. Drum roll, please. All right, all right. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have we have the incomparable Matt Chan. Love it, love it, love it. So, Thank you, Matt guys. Chan, Matt Chan, I just want to tell you, right, that I am a, I am a huge fan. I, I was very excited when um when Frankie said he was able to get you. I didn't think he was going to be able to get you, but um, ah. I appreciate you uh, coming on here and talking to us. Thanks again. Thank you guys for having me. It's uh it's always a pleasure to be with the the brothers in blue and uh, and get a chance to talk to you guys, especially about you know stuff like mindset and all that. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, before we start, you know, congrat, congrats on the Titan Games too, and thank you for your service. Really appreciate it. We'll talk about that. That's really, really some cool stuff. Um, just want to see, kind of how you're doing like right now in, in the present moment, man. What we always say, look down at your feet, man. There's no gift like the present. So, kind of, how's the past few weeks been for you? And kind of getting used to, I mean, I yeah. guess get used to the COVID, but you know how life is treating you right now. Yeah, you know, it's been a, a rough year, like I'm sure it has for everybody. Um, you know, we had a lot of plans for this springtime, uh, doing a couple races, uh, doing a kind of lifetime trip uh, to the Alps. We were going to do this ski route from uh, Chamonix, France to Zermatt, Switzerland. Uh, it's, it was seven days, six nights, um, and you cross 120 kilometers of like high altitude uh, s- ski terrain. So we were really excited about that. Been looking at that for 20 years and uh finally pulled the trigger to do it and of course it got canceled so um you know a little bummed but uh you know followed that up with getting uh getting covid i I had covid as of i I tested positive on uh july 2nd um so i was quarantined and isolated and all that stuff by myself for uh, 11 days and worked through that Um, But in that same time, I was, I obviously, you know, in in February recorded the Titan games, which is obviously a really high point for my year. So that was super rad. Awesome. awesome. I actually know um, one of the, actually I know two of the people that were on um, Titan games. So Courtney Rosell is a really good friend of mine. Oh, she's the best. Yeah. Yeah. She was raving about you guys. And so I just wanted to relay that she thinks you're awesome. And I was like, Hey man, like, you know, what was it like being around, you know, Matt and these guys? That it was a, an experience of a lifetime. She'll be on the show later this season as well. Oh, cool! Yeah, Courtney. Courtney was one of those people. You know, when we were around each other, the, people got nervous. They their attitudes changed a little bit as the as their events uh, unfolded, whether they won or lost. Courtney was always just a beacon of of uh, lightheartedness and and happiness, yeah. and she was awesome to be around. So, and I'd say most of the people were, you know, especially uh, you know Will Sutton on the men's side was. Yeah. Just so much fun to be around the whole time. So, um, 
you know, there was times where I got a little, little uh, nervous because I thought I was going to get knocked out of there. But, um, you know, talking to him always made the days pass and all that stuff. So. So, so how was that as a whole? Like, um, you know, were you nervous going into it? Like, like, like what was your thought process getting into the, uh, the Titans or going into the Titans? I should say? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I got initially when they contacted me after the combine and my application and everything, they told me I was going to be an alternate. So I didn't actually think I was going there as, as a competitor. Um, but about a day or maybe two days at the most before the flight to Atlanta, uh, they, they contacted me and said that somebody had hurt themselves and I was able to, you know, they asked me if I wanted to be on. And of course you're going to answer yes. That's why I was, you know, book, booked on the flight. Um, but, you know, I'd say as a whole, it was, it was interesting. It wasn't like CrossFit uh, because there was a whole Hollywood element to it. Um, and, and the other side of that was, although it was very athletic and required, you know, a multitude of fitness, uh, you know, traits or capacities, there, there's nothing there that you could practice. So it was uh -huh. just, yeah, it's just on the fly stuff. So, you know, I felt really comfortable with that, where I think a lot of other guys, especially there's a few CrossFit athletes that uh, maybe don't do as much outdoor sports or, or maybe stuff that we do on the fire, fire ground. Um, you know, they were clearly not as uh, comfortable with a lot of the events. So I had a really good mindset the pretty much the whole time. I got a little frustrated when I lost to Joe Thomas uh, initially, but it also fired me up because I really wanted to face him again and, and get another shot. That's awesome. So, so do you think that uh, your, your experience as a firefighter and like a lot of, you know, people who don't know you're like an outdoorsman, right? you ride mountain biking, you think of that nature, you think that played in your favor, um, you know, being that you, you know, like, you know, we all say that we're functional athletes, but in, in mm -hmm. essence you are because you're an outdoorsman, you, you know, um, you, know you, you, ride mountain, you, ride, you ride mountain bikes and so on. So like, do you feel like that helped you being that, you, you know, you dabble in those type of things that helped you in, um, during the event? Yeah, and uh, to a certain degree, yes. Um, but the, I think the, you know, there's not a direct application to some of that stuff other than uh, the ability to adapt on the fly. So like, you know, when you mountain bike, climb, ski, you know, it's not like a barbell where it's predictable and it's going to lay there on the ground the same every single time. You know, when you're skiing, you got to be light on your feet. You got to, you know, be able to adjust on the fly. And I think that sort of thing, even though it's like, you know, there was obviously no skiing or mountain biking, it really helps, uh, you know, makes you think on your toes. And that sort of athleticism definitely pays off in the real world where, yeah. you know, the, the fitness you build inside of the gym is the, st it's, it's the base layer, right? If you have all of that, then all the other sports or events that you can participate in, um, it just makes them that much easier. Okay. So this is, I, I think a lot of people don't account for those like valuable. So like I always say, uh, you could be really good at fitness, but it doesn't really make you a great athlete. So being that you have to be, you know, well-rounded, I think a lot of people, especially CrossFit, I feel like, you know, if they're really good at like breaks or they're really good at like brand, doesn't necessarily mean like if I told you to run an obstacle course and you got to, you know, scale a wall or, 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 or climb like a cargo net wall or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of guys don't do that type of stuff. So when it's time to do that, that's where you kind of see the glaring weakness. So, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I'm watching, I'm watching the thing. Wow. I, I don't think anyone would even, like some of these events just kind of, kind of came out of like left field. So like for, for, for a CrossFitter, was there like one particular event that you saw that you were like, mm, I don't know, like if I'm going to do well at this? Um, well, yeah, I, I honestly, a, a lot of them. Um, I, I think the one that was the closest thing to CrossFit uh, that, you know, something I practiced was the one that was called Lunar Impact, where I went against Bartley Weaver, the really big guy. And it's yeah, the yeah, one yeah, where yeah. You, you push that door back and forth on each other. Um, I was really comfortable on a ladder, so I knew I'd move up that quickly. But he's such a big guy. Uh, once you hit that wall, it's basically, um, it's like a sled push. You know, you're just, okay. just grinding and grinding and grinding. So like a super heavy sled push. So I knew that... Um, I only had so much gas in, in the tank. And that was one of the things that I was kind of like, oh man, I can't, I can't blow myself out trying to, trying to push him off the end. Um, but at the same time, maybe I can wear him out. So that was the closest thing. But then other, other events, it was like, oh crap, you know, um, what's, what's one, I mean, Mount Olympus, for example, there was no, that looked hard. 
Yeah, I mean, there's no, um, there was a lot of places to make mistakes. And in my first run, I did make those mistakes. Um, but, you know, none of it's anything I've ever practiced before, other than maybe like that one that was like a tire flip, uh, that big box. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so usually, uh, sorry, we got off into the tangent and Titan games. I was just really intrigued. So a lot of <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, I got to ask these guys some questions. But um, yeah, normally how, how the rundown goes is, you know, we, uh, we start with like your high school career. So how was your high school career for uh, Matt Chandler? Yeah, I grew up swimming. Um, I, I swam in, in high school. That was my primary sport. And, you know, just like a lot of other uh, sports, you know, even in the off season, you're still around that group of people. So um, I, I was a high school swimmer and uh, the guys that I swam with, I grew up with from literally the age of five. Uh, I'm still friends with some of them today. Um, okay. So that was kind of my, that was my circle. That was my, you know, niche, you know, if you will. And uh, I played water polo in college uh, after, you know, basically a, a full lifetime of swimming and, and sometimes two a days, uh, it just kind of burned me out. So like being part of a team sport was something I wanted to try and water polo uh, at the Western, at Western, Illinois, Western Illinois University was really um, a small club sport. And it, okay. I, was able, I was able to play even though I didn't have much uh, actual water polo experience but I had the swim, the swimming side of it. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, we built a team and took ninth in the nation my senior year, which was absolutely a huge achievement. Um, and that's kind of where I learned how to train. Uh, you know, I, I, I had never done a lot of dry land or, or weight training prior to college. And, you know, I was a good enough swimmer in water polo that, uh, that wasn't an issue, but being stronger, uh, you know, actually being able to battle with guys in the water was, was a weakness for me. So I started weight training and getting better at that stuff. And, you know, with, with time, I just learned how to train better and get better. Um, and then after, after college, I went to uh, winter park resort. Uh, I was a, a ski bum for a couple of years, uh, which was a, a, just a ton of fun, you know, skied a hundred days a year and, uh, and, rode a lot of mountain bikes, did all that stuff. And then uh, shortly after that, I, I uh, was introduced to firefighting. I got a, a job in the fire, fire service and uh, that's where I was introduced to CrossFit. Wait, so uh, nah. what year did you get on um, with FD? Uh, so I, I actually was an, originally a volunteer with uh, Grand County Fire, uh, which is up in near Winter Park. Uh, but I got on with uh, in 2007 with North Metro Fire, uh, which is a north suburb of Denver. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Frank. I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, that's all right. No, I like how it, I kind of laughed a little bit when you said land training. Like, you know, you just like this. This yeah. Poseidon, I didn't like this Poseidon like guy, you know? What, um, what, yeah. what kind of training was – so it wasn't a lot of weightlifting in high school. It was more in college when you started the weightlifting? Yeah, yeah. So I had never, you know – Prior to this, you guys will laugh about this, but prior to CrossFit, uh, starting CrossFit at a, an affiliate in 2007, I had never done a deadlift. I'd never done a barbell, for, like a like an actual barbell squat. I'd only done like a, a Smith machine squat. So my my exposure to weightlifting was very, very limited. And in college, I was basically doing uh, like the Men's Health Magazine uh training programs that they had because that that's all i knew that's all i could old, get information about old school uh, that's that's some of the old school big time guys we've had on here like the lifters they got all their stuff from the magazine so i just was interested in what kind of training you were doing like if it was a strength program or you kind of just said it yourself the men, men health fitness way before the instagram time and i don't even know if facebook was out yet in 2007 well, yeah. i remember like 2008 2009 you know what i mean well, well, yeah. So I, I mean, well, I was in college from 97 until 2001. So to put things in perspective, you know, 97 is when, you know, the internet, <laughs> people started using the internet and email and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I was know, just I, getting I, out of diapers, man. I was five years old. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, we got everything on paper, like, you know, magazines right. and, and all that stuff. Like, you know, I don't even know if there were training programs available online yet. 
Yeah, I was uh, I was in high school in '96. I was a freshman in '96, '97. I was a freshman in high school, so that's just kind of putting things in perspective. Um, yeah. Now, now, when did you realize that like you could actually do something in the sport of CrossFit? Um, Sorry if you so hear noise I, in the background. They're doing construction in the gym. So if you hear anything, yeah, no worries. Yeah, in, uh, you know, I went to the to, to to think you know back a bit. Uh, 2008 was my first year at the CrossFit Games, but it was sign up and go. It was sign up and go. So like, you know, there was no qualification. There was no, um, you know, there was no sanctional. There was nothing like that. It was literally, you pay your $150, you show up in Santa Cruz and uh, you compete at Dave Castro's ranch. And that was the first year. Yep. Second year, there was a little bit of a regionals and uh, I did uh, not as well. I took eighth in the first year. I took, uh, I think, 19th in the second year. And during that second year, that's when I realized it's something I wanted to be good at. So I started putting training into it. Um, okay. I didn't, I didn't really, you know, I mean, if you, it's interesting because you look back in 2009 and uh, training for CrossFit, especially CrossFit competitions, that was non-existent. People were only doing one workout a day. People were only uh, doing, you know, just, strength every three days or so so you know the first person that uh that i looked up to was a fellow firefighter named miko salo who won the 2009 games and he did multiple training sessions each day and he had a really well-rounded fitness so i i kind of modeled how i would train for a little while off of what he did but at the same time um i didn't have all the time that he did so I had to be a little more efficient with what I was doing each day. I couldn't break my training sessions up into morning, afternoon, and evening sessions. So I tried to get what I could in, in about two hours. And uh, that year I got significantly better. And that's when I realized, okay, I could probably do well in, in the CrossFit games if I really applied myself. So I took fourth place in 2010. I took 10th place in 2011 and I took second place in 2012. Those are my kind of best uh, years. Um, so that was, so I was having a conversation with the owner of my gym, right? And we were just like literally five minutes ago and we were trying to figure out what year it was that you finished second. Um, was that the year that they had the, um, the swim muscle up workout? That was 2013. Uh, That's 2013. And, okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting thing happened, uh, in 2013. I, I, you know, I kind of lost focus. Um, you know, we were, my wife and I, after our 2012 year, uh, we went out in an Airstream, you know, just a travel trailer and, and drove around the country and we just kept doing it for a year. Um, I still was working for CrossFit HQ and all that stuff, but um, I lost focus. And even though I qualified, you know, I won my region and I qualified for the CrossFit Games, my heart really wasn't totally in it. Um, so I think I only finished, uh, like 16th place that year. Um, and it, it showed, you know, I just, I just didn't perform as well. But now, um, wait, Frank, I got to ask this question. So they were the ahead, year on a roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Cause it's, uh, I actually saw this. This was on like Instagram when I like first got on Instagram. You had a fasciotomy, correct? What year was that? You got hurt mountain biking, correct? Yeah, that was the following year. So that was 2014. That was yeah, okay. so you know, everything's kind I, of a blur to me. Yeah, 2014. So I mean, I uh, after the 2013 games, I kind of wanted to refocus and and start training super hard, and I ended up hurting my back, um, just doing too much. And uh, you know, I I wasn't able to participate in the Open that year, um, which at the time I think was like in February. Uh, so I had to sit out the Open, which means I couldn't qualify for regionals or the games. Um, so I was kind of taking it easy, getting my back better. And then, uh, you know, in July, my wife and I just went for a quick mountain bike ride and I just took a spill and I really, really fucked myself up. I, uh, I severed the right branch of my femoral artery and, you know, luckily I didn't open up the skin or else I wouldn't be here with you today. Um, but yeah, I got flown out to a level one trauma center and they gave me three fasciotomies to, to get blood flow back to my lower legs. So, um, that was a, big, big setback. And, uh, I basically had to not only kind of rehab, but also start over with strength training and start over with what could I do with my, 
with my right leg. And, and definitely it was a big challenge on my mindset for sure. Um, that, so, that, that's crazy. Go ahead, Frankie. Yeah. That, I didn't even know about, I, I didn't even know, know that about you. And uh, that brings me to a whole nother level of what this podcast about is uh, dying not literally, but figuratively, and could be coming back a new person. Um, the question, I, before I hit this question, I just asked you, I wanted to kind of see where your mind was at, like at Young Matt, like what drew you into CrossFit? Like how did you find that training and say, I'm going to compete? You know, like not picking up a deadlift, a barbell, not squatting, not kind of being afraid to go into that, that deepest part of the cave and say, I'm going to give this a shot. Like wh where, how did your mindset get attracted to that? Well, I started in 2007 just to get better at firefighting because I really, you know, I was, like I told you guys, I, I was just following those kind of back and by test and try, you know, legs and shoulders sort of workouts um, and, you know, do cardio every day. And then unfortunately that doesn't pay off real well on the fire ground where you got to use your whole body all at the same time while breathing heavy. And I really suffered. Um, the guys in my academy all did better than me uh, on the fire ground the instructors, you know, my cadre of instructors, they, they definitely took notice and they would be like, come on, Chan, let's get moving. Let's get moving. And, uh, I had a real tough time. And, uh, my first day online, uh, one of the guys I was working with was like, yeah, you know, I, I mean, you look fit, all that stuff. Maybe you should try this, uh, CrossFit thing. Um, and I looked up CrossFit.com and, and tried the, one of the workouts from the, uh, was the first day I got off shift from my first shift and uh, I was like oh my gosh so it was a it was a workout called Angie which is 100 pull-ups 100 push-ups 100 sit-ups 100 squats and uh, I was like I was thinking to myself it's just like you know at that time 100 pull-ups you're just thinking like well, I don't understand is this like <laughs> like how are you going to do 100 pull-ups in a workout that doesn't make any sense to me um, so I read through the comments and you're you know you're seeing people who are I remember seeing Chris Spieler on the, on the comment uh, log and he, he had something in there like 12 minutes and 15 seconds. And I was just like, I don't understand. Are they breaking this up or is that 12 minutes just for the pull-ups? I don't get this. So I think that took me like 45 <laughs> minutes or something like that. And uh, yeah. once I understood what was happening, I was like, Holy shit, these people are crazy fit. Like this is nuts. And uh, I just kept training with it, kept training with it. And I think that uh, that mindset of kind of being willing to go to the pain cave that developed over time because it definitely was not there initially. I wanted to be comfortable. I didn't like being super out of breath, but I started to develop a sense of this power that was within me. And I just wanted to see it develop. I wanted to see it come out of me and I wanted to enjoy the, the, like you said, just the, the, the pain of these workouts. And, uh, I really fell in love with that feeling. And that's why I just kept coming back is because every day was different and I could try something I've never done before and just see what I had inside of me. And I really, I really enjoyed that side of it. So what was your weight starting weight then compared to what you are now? Uh, I was 190 and now I weigh, I just weighed this morning and I'm a little heavy. I haven't been eating so good, but I was uh, 219 this morning. And when you competed in like what we talked about, were, were you between 190 and 200 or you kind of went on yeah. the heavier side? No, I was a little heavier. So I was like uh, on average between 208 and 212. Um, and that's where I am. Yeah. Now, you know, that's where I am now. Generally, it's just uh, you know, the last we've had a lot of overtime on, on shift. And uh, that means a lot of ice cream. So. <laughs> <laughs> so like for, for, for those of you guys that don't know, he mentioned Chris Spieler. So Chris Spieler is like a, He's like a demigod in CrossFit, man. He's this little guy, right? Yep. And he is just fearless. And, and uh, Frankie, if you ever get a chance, look up uh, Chris Spieler because this dude has, like, the heart of a lion. So he's mentioning a lot of these guys that he's mentioning are, like, perennial, like, games guys. These are fixtures in yep. the sport of CrossFit. So it's like I hear your name, and it, to me it's just synonymous with, with CrossFit. It's like do, do like do guys in the CrossFit community where you're from, do they, do they kind of have that same kind of – uh, outlook on you or they just treat you like regular Matt when you walk into the gym yeah no I think I'm just regular Matt um you know that oh, was a long crazy time. I know that's but that crazy, was a long time yeah. ago 
the last time I was in the games was 2013. That was seven years ago. There's probably, yeah. you know, most of the people in the gym are, that are walking in, they've been involved with CrossFit for maybe three years, maybe five years. So, yeah. you know, all that stuff that we did, I'm kind of before their time, I feel like. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it allows me to just go in and work out and get it over with. Cause I, you know, I don't compete anymore. I just work out. That's I'm, I'm training for life. Um, and then the other part of that is like my ego kind of got out of control for a number of years there. And, you know, I, I thought, I thought a lot of myself and it just, it was a bad, uh, a bad mind space for me. And, uh, I'm glad that now it's just, I get to be myself. I get to you know, be more humble. I get to not be as com competitive about this stuff. It's just I'm going in there and I'm training. Training for life. I like that. Yep. That's uh, yep. yeah. I, lo I love that statement. Training for life. Um, I got it. So a lot of people, I didn't even know that you were an active prospect in 2007. So like, um, take us through like a training day for you as far as like, um, or like, or like a week because you guys are on shift. You guys work 24s or we actually well, how, work 48s. Work oh, you work 48s. Okay, so are you able to train while you're on shift? Like, how does that go? And what is, like, yeah, a typical you... day for Matt Chan now versus Matt Chan, the, the competitor, the, the, the perennial game guy? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely changed. Uh, so back in the day, uh, so 2012, I took a leave of absence um, for training uh, in particular. And that actually ended up extending past a year, and I ended up, um, not working at the fire department for five years. And during that time I was training, uh, for several hours a day. Um, every day I would do strength, skill work, uh, conditioning work. I'd be on a, at a track. I would swim, you know, all those things like throughout the week, I would spend four to five hours, uh, training for c competition. And, you know, now it's, maybe an hour a day, you know, 45 minutes to an hour a day. I do some conditioning. Uh, I, I do some conditioning probably five days a week, but I also do dedicated strength days where I don't add any additional stuff other than uh, isolated bodybuilding work. Um, I find that the bodybuilding stuff is an easy way for me. And this is probably true of most 35 plus year old guys. Uh, it's an easy way to add volume. Yeah. It's an easy way to add volume and keep muscle mass on um, without beating up your body. So I really, really like that. And I include that daily. I do that every day after conditioning or after strength work. I do accessory work that targets certain muscle groups. Um, but generally, I found that like if I do high intensity workouts, so like just as an example, Fran, you know, I can only do that two to three days a week without my body starting to feel the aches and pains and having it affect me at work or doing the other stuff that I like to do now, like mountain biking, hiking, climbing, hunting, all that stuff. So I generally only do high intensity conditioning work two days a week, maybe three if I'm feeling really good. Um, but I like to focus on aerobic work a little bit more. And I think, um, I think that deserves some explanation too. My aerobic work is not just running or rowing or biking. It's, you know, I'm still mix, doing mixed modality stuff like kettlebell swings, box step ups, uh, air squats, but I'm doing it at a very low heart rate. And, and therefore I'm still uh, getting a lot of reps and a lot of volume in, but at, at low intensity. And that seems to be working really well for me. Um, the only thing that's kind of a, a disclaimer is that, um, you know, I don't carry as much muscle mass as I used to. And if that's what people are after, um, you know, that's where that high intensity work really, it does, it puts on a ton of muscle mass. Um, now, is there, is there like a target heart rate zone that you're, that you're trying to like stay in when you're doing this work? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've done the VO2 max, uh, test and lactate threshold test. But generally, um, you know, a good rule of thumb that you, that you can apply for everybody is 180 minus your age. So that, that, can, that can give you a good kind of range where, you'd, where you should try to stick if you're specifically targeting aerobic work. 
And then you'd like, you know, obviously longer duration. So, you know, I consider aerobic work anything over 12 to 15 minutes at a lower heart rate. So for me, that would be like 138 target heart rate. And I just try to maintain that all the way across. For some movements, like take, for example, a wall ball or a thruster or even, even pull-ups, those jack your heart rate up. So the way that I write my workouts is that I'm going to include those things, but it's for short number of repetitions. And then immediately after, let's just say, uh, you know, five thrusters at 115 pounds, I set the bar down and I do something that's very low intensity that I can recover from the thrusters like single under jump ropes or box step ups, you know, something where it's like, it's, it's not a difficult movement, but I'm going to get a lot of repetitions, which will, which will, you know, build the volume, but not necessarily beat up the body and it allow me to recover. For our job, that's super important for, uh, for uh, firefighting. That's super, super important because, um, you know, we have moments of high intensity. So like, you know, make, making entry into a structure that's on fire, you know, getting the hose line to the fire, super high intensity, but you have to learn to also recover and sit on the hose line, put the fire out, do some overhaul at a pace that you can sustain sustain yourself. Because if you burn through your bottle, you're totally useless. You know, that's, that's kind of what my job is like. So I think the, uh, the way that I've been programming is not only good for me physically, but also it's good for my capacity as, as being a firefighter. Also it translates over to your, uh, to the workplace. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to notice the same thing. Um, so I'm 37 and I'm starting to see like, it's like two to three days a week. And that's like max of, of me, like doing like some legit Metcon. Yeah. Um, and it took a little bit for me to kind of realize, like, all right, you know, I, I'm obviously, I, you know, I was never a games athlete or anything like that. But um, I had to realize that, you know, I'm getting older. I need to train a lot more smarter and listen to my body. So it was, it was just great to hear you say these things. So I, you see me jotting here and I'm taking notes because um, it, 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 it's just very hard for me to kind of like grasp that concept. Like, all right, Jay, you got to like, um, you know, ease your foot off the throttle and kind of get back to just staying functional for work. And, um, you know, just making sure that I'm able to perform when I get to work. So we do the same thing. Like uh, we have Scott Packs and, and the same thing. I need to work on my breathing because we do backup fire on certain poles. There's a structure fire and they need us to do um, anything in the, in the rescue capacity. So I do understand the whole like being able to not burn through a bottle and, and being able to recover. If these guys need help, you know, on an extrication job or something like that, I need to be accessible. And I need to be functional so that I can be a, um, a asset and not a liability. So so thank you for bringing that up, man. I, I really appreciate it. Well, yeah. And, gems today. and one of the cool things that, that training with, uh, with CrossFit does is, I mean, obviously we train with different energy pathways in mind. So, you know, you've got your very short and very intense stuff. Uh, and that could be something like a hundred meter row or a hundred meter sprint or a three rep max back squat. You've got your glycolytic stuff. That's kind of like that up to three minutes of super high intensity uh, conditioning work. And then you've got your aerobic stuff. That's that long stuff. And what I think, um, training using the CrossFit method has helped me with is understanding where I'm at. Uh, so if I'm working really hard on the fire ground, I'm like, Oh shit, I only have, you know, if I keep going at this pace, I'm going to blow my wad in like three minutes and then I'm going to be totally useless. So I got to slow this shit down. Whereas the guys I work with that don't train with that sort of method or mentality, you can see them start at that pace and then you just watch them fade and fade and fade and fade. And then you look behind you and you're like, where the hell is so-and-so behind me? And uh, luckily, you know, I think it's becoming more um, widespread mainstream as a way of training and people are seeing the benefits uh, to, to using those methods. And, you know, for firefighters, it doesn't have to be crazy. It doesn't have to be crossfit.com. It doesn't have to be 275 pound deadlifts, you know, in a, in a conditioning workout, but just performing functional movements at different rates or paces is super, super beneficial. I love that, Jay. I don't know about you, man. I, I love, man. I love that mindset where you just look you took a fire and you looked at it as a wad like that is huge 
And um, I, I'm my girlfriend is a big crossfitter. I'm not, but uh, I just recently I had a rough year last uh, 2019 2018. But I just competed in my first strongman show on the start of 2020 end of 2019. Nice. And I was asked if you ever if you ever dabbled with any strongman um, events because for me it's like you know you're. The, the carrying, the sled work, that stuff, you know, in the in CrossFit as well. It's so, it relates to the real world, you know, so it, it fits the narrative, you know, like, and even trying to handcuff people now with everything going on, people think that you could do it by yourself and it's easy. I mean, a minute or two minutes can feel like two hours and you can feel the whole wad, you know, you, you get them in cuffs by yourself. That two, three minutes could be the whole entire wad. Like, I love that you said that. And you don't know what else can happen. You know, you could turn around and all of a sudden someone else is coming at you with the phone or trying to break, let, you know, let this person out of the car. You have no idea what's going to happen. So um, I'm really happy you, you brought that up. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of interested if you ever uh, did any strongman events or just trained that way as well. Like you kind of said that, that I guess that one minute all out type of deal, you know? Yeah. So I've, I've never done an actual strongman competition. Although, you know, like you said, those implements are, phenomenal for functional fitness. So I, I definitely, you know, I have a set of rogue strong, uh, strongman bags. Um, we've got a yoke, um, obviously sleds, yeah. love the sleds, um, got stones at the gym. Um, and all of that stuff is, I mean, it makes your training more varied. And I try to include that stuff regularly because, you know, like you said, as far as our tactical jobs go, I mean, grabbing a stone and moving it is just like grabbing a human being. It's not going to be uh, a perfect hold. It's not going to, it's going to wiggle out. Right. I try to wiggle out of your arms. And it's everything so uneven. Like yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really love all that stuff and I especially love sandbags because like, you know, for, for people in our communities that the, uh, the sandbag is just like a dead weight human. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the looser, the better, because like, you know, if, you've got a 150 pound sandbag that's pretty loose. It is. It's like trying to pick up a human that is, you know, dead weight. And it's, it's so hard, but when you've done it in practice, you know, you can do it in the field and you know, there's an easy way to perform the lift and there's a way to do it as a team. So I really, I enjoy the strongman stuff. And I think as far as, you know, bang for your buck, uh, equipment, I think, you know, obviously have a barbell, have bumper plates, have a set of dumbbells, have a pull-up bar, but yeah, a set of uh, strongman bags is probably number four on the list. Yeah, I'm happy you brought that up with the mindset, Matt, because in my, like, even on far farmer carries as well, you know, like, all right, if I could do 200 pound farmer carries on each hand, or I could do a 200 pound sandbag and you got to drag this person, you know, like, okay, I got this, you know, and, may, and, and it's going to be uneven because obviously it's a barbell. It's not going to be even as a barbell or a hex bar, you know, but as mm -hmm. long as you have that mindset as I've done this so many times, it's not as bad as, as you think, you know, and you just go and do it instead of, Oh, can I do this? How should I pick this person up? You know, and then tick, 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 that every, you know, every second, it, every second counts um have you ever hit have you ever dabbled with the uh the log before a clean and press with the log yeah so we we have uh we have one of those i've had it for almost 10 years now uh one of those uh steel logs that um it's not you know it's not a wood log but uh and it's plate loaded right, right. on the ends yeah. uh yeah we've I've, I've messed with that quite a bit um you know back in the day when i was training for the crossfit games it's one of those things that I would never train with uh, early in the season because they would never include those special implements. But when I was preparing for the CrossFit games, like those, that month leading up to it, we would use all the weird implements. And if you look back in 2011, 2012, 2013, the events where there were uh, odd implements is when I did the best. And it's because I, I use that stuff regularly. And nothing would light me up like a, uh, a log shoulder to overhead for reps. It wouldn't even take that much weight, but I think it's because you have to lean back so far uh, because you've got that huge log in your face. Uh, it would just light me up, man. I think of it as a person. Like you're literally trying to pick up a person. A 12 inch log is so big. You're picking up a person and putting it overhead. That's literally what I think when I'm looking at the log, you know, and, you know, I don't have a big frame. So that big log on, on me, I'm like, on me, I'm like, oh shit, here we go again. You know? So that's, that's kind of how, how I think of it. So yeah. thanks for bringing that point up, man. 
Yeah. Yeah. Frankie was the first guy to, uh, you know, um, really help me with like stones. I never had any kind of like training in it. I went up to go train at Frankie's house one day. And um, how big were those stones, Frankie? It was about a one seventy. Uh, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't as. It wasn't. It was one seventy five, like medium pound stone. Like, yeah. But it, it looks big. Yeah, They're well, sitting in my in my freaking front yard like a garden home. You know. They're just sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. <laughs> and that thing was a son of a bitch because I was just sitting there trying to like you know, manhandle this thing. And it was kind of manhandling me. It's just a very awkward object. You have to, you know, it's like very grip intensive and, and you know, my forearms are chafing and killing me, but um, yeah. it does translate into what I do at work. So, um, you know, Frankie will kind of open up my eyes and says, Hey, you know, Jason, you might want to implement these strong man, um, you know, techniques because it's definitely going to help us, you know, in the real world and in case of an event where I have to maybe grab a human being and, and drag them or, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, in a rescue element, like you said, sandbags, stones, things of that nature, awkward, odd objects um, are definitely something that I'll come across. So I started to throw those things into my training. And I think, you know, um, the people who listen to us, our, 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 uh, our fan base, um, are mainly first responders. And I think you saying that will definitely um, have these people kind of look at, you know, look at their training and say, you know what, all this stuff that Matt just mentioned is stuff that's all applicable and all things that I can, you know, I have access to. So I just want yeah. to you know, give you a kudos for that. Well, Jay, you know, I think another part of that is, you know, we talked about those lower intensity days that, you know, the aging uh, uh, athlete or tactical athlete that they, that they have to have. Um, there's nothing fast about, you know, shouldering a stone or shouldering a heavy sandbag. It's slow. Yep. And that, and that can be very beneficial to, we, we call those, uh, what is it? Slow, no go. Uh, so basically you can take a workout where you the intention is to move slower, but still have a little taste of intensity. So a slow yeah. movement might be something like a heavy sandbag or stone to the shoulder, right? That it takes time to set up. It takes time to get it to your lap and it takes time to get it to your shoulder and then reset. So that's your slow movement. Your, your no movement would be something like uh, an L-sit hold or a tuck hold hanging from a pull-up bar. Gotcha. So there's, there's no actual movement gotcha. happening. That's pretty cool. you're, just, you're just holding. But then you mix in one high-intensity element, and that's the go movement, where it could be a run, or it could be row, or it could be cycling clean and jerks. Um, so slow no go is something that we use to reduce intensity overall. Um, and the, that's a great place to add the addition in that slow movement of all these sand, uh, all these strongman movements that you guys are talking about. Wow. Yeah. I love that because, you know, like you just said, the slow, if you're going like, and people that don't, ha don't really mess around with the sandbag or the stone and that, you know, I mean, if you're not, your technique is not on point, that bicep can rip right out. If you're not squeezing it as hard as you can with your forearms and you're really getting underneath it and you're, you're lifting it with your, your bicep and everything, you know, that's, you don't want to go fast, fast, fast your first time on a sandbag, you know, because then if you do get hurt, that's going to, that mind game is going to be, uh, most people probably will say, I don't want to do this again, you know, and then you're, now you're back into, you're back into the cave, right, Matt? You're back into the cave where you kind of, it's Ugh. sucking you in where you already were there and now you're coming down and stuff like that. And Jay brought that point up for a month. I did, um, the log I, during COVID. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to test my mind a little bit. I did log bench, log deadlift, log squat, and log overhead. And the log squat was something else, man. With that thing on your back, it was it, it was it was something oh, else. I could but, only uh, imagine. It was uh, really really cool to 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 put to push uh, to push the mind. And every time I pick up that log, I'm like, all right, if this is a person in front of me, and that's kind of, you know, how I tell first responders that come out. You know, when we had the gym that was open, and then some were coming to my house, where you know, think of this as. You know, try to make this as, like you said too, Matt, as best for you. You don't have to do 275 deadlift every time. You know, you need to keep something that's going to keep you going for the ultimate, that one day that it's going to save your life. You know, we're yeah, not training a, that, for, for suffering. We're training so we can save our lives and our partner's life. And it's very hard to get there to realize, you know, what why I'm really here, you know? If yeah, I wanted to look great, if we all wanted to look really, really great, I think we'd be in bodybuilding. But this stuff is more beneficial for our lives and for our career. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do agree. And I, I also think that what, what you were saying about like kind of starting with the end in mind is super important. Like, hey, this is my first day doing this stuff. I need to just be safe, get some reps, feel good about the technique, and then I'll worry about adding a little bit of weight or intensity. And uh, 
you know, I think as adults, uh, you know, you know, I hate to say middle age, but you know, towards the middle of our lives, we can all, we <laughs> can all kind of, we're, we're willing to accept those facts that it's like, if I lift that log right now with the weight that he's got on it, I'm going to probably fall backwards and kill myself. So I'm, yep. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to try it. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to take the plates off and I'll put it back on for him. Um, but you know, when we were all probably in our early twenties, there's no way we would have done that. It'd be like, nah, 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 I got it. I got it. Right. <laughs> um, you said a key phrase, oh, right? You man, said tactical stuff. athlete, right? And, um, no. so here's another thing that me and Matt have in common. Um, Matt was a featured athlete on O2X performance. Um, uh, that's a, that's a, um, company that's uh, based out of Massachusetts and they, they deal with tactical athletes and, uh, they pick like an athlete of the month. And, um, I actually saw you on there and I was like, wow, like, this, you know, this dude that I look up to, um, in the fitness realm is a, you know, a featured athlete. And I was a featured athlete as well. Um, that whole tactical athlete to me is a whole different realm. And it's, it's great that you brought that up because I wanted to segue into that. Um, part of the, the O2X mentality is eat, sleep, thrive. Right. And, you know, all of that is the training and the eating and the, and, and also the thriving aspect is the meditation and the self, the self-reflection and the time that we're taking, you know, for ourselves, um, being that we have high stress, um, jobs and, and, and we deal with high stress situations and also deal with traumatic situations at work. What's a way that you, um, you know, decompress and, and do some like, you know, self-reflection, you know, like some Matt Chan time. Well, um, outside of doing the gym stuff and getting outside, outside is definitely the biggest thing for me where I get time either with my, just by myself, uh, you know, like I love to hunt. And I think part of uh, hunting for me, uh, you know, Western big game hunting is not sitting in a tree stand. It's out walking around. You've got your bow or your rifle on your back and your exposure to animals is pretty limited. So it's really, it's just about going for a long walk and, uh, I think that those moments I get to think about things pretty, pretty closely uh, and, and do some self-examination of where I'm at, what I need to work on, maybe uh, some, some elements of my life that I've let get out of control. And I need to, I need to kind of reach back in and, and try to try to improve those things. But um, also, you know, I do a couple other things that I think are really beneficial for me. I, I do, a, I do a morning re, uh, reflection. Uh, have you guys ever heard of uh, Ryan Holiday and the Daily Stoic? He was just on Mark yeah, Bell's yeah. podcast. He yeah, so Adam on Mark Bell's for yeah. I'm about eight months into his 366 days of uh, stoicism. Uh, he's got a book called The Daily Stoic, uh, which I would recommend for any. Um, tactical athlete or first responder, because that book, uh, it, it takes 10 minutes a day uh, to read the passage and the interpretation of, you know, Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, whatever the passage is, uh, Ryan Holiday breaks it down just very briefly in one or two paragraphs. And then you write, uh, you know, in the morning and in the evening before you go to bed, just a sentence or two about either how that passage made you feel, how you can apply it to your life. And I've learned a lot of stuff with that, that uh, I, I think that all self, or, I'm sorry, all first responders have to deal with on a regular basis. And the biggest things for me are, you know, that I've learned and, and been able to apply is it's okay to not have an opinion. Like that's one thing that I always wanted to argue with everybody. And it made me you know, not get along with people. It made me uh, maybe come off as uh, a prick to some people. And I've gotten along better with the guys that I work with by just holding my opinion to myself and listening to what they have to say and let them use their opinions because maybe I would never even consider it without hearing their opinion. And then the other thing is like, you know, trying to kill your ego. Um, that's a big thing, a message that Marcus Aurelius and Seneca um, have is just like, you know, find your place in, in your groups and stuff like that. And they have a million different ways of putting it, but really what it comes down to is just smashing your ego and recognizing your place in, in the, in the scheme of things. So those are probably the two biggest things, but I also, you know, I think, um, you know, just, just, uh, exercise is, is, a is a therapy for me. I, you know, uh, unlike a lot of people, I, I, I actually don't turn the music on most of the time when I work out. I just let it be blank. Uh, 
I work out in an empty gym when I possibly, when I can, uh, or in my garage gym. And I just like to just think about some stuff and kind of see where I'm at and, you know, take a, take a mental inventory of what's in place and what's out of place. Um, I mean, what's running through your mind when you do those, like those workouts and how often are you doing those workouts with no music, just kind of being in, um, being in your own space. Um, cause I'm, I'm just very curious cause I'm at a, I'm at a place right now where, you know, with everything that's going on in the world and in and, and a minute, like I'll pick up my phone or, or I'll turn on the TV. It's something, it's some kind of negative rhetoric about police officers. And, you know, Frank and I, you know, had started out this podcast to help people and, and, and people from all walks of life, but mainly in our, in our field, you know, we, uh, we see a lot of things and we go through a lot of stuff on a daily basis. We really don't have an outlet. So we try to create an outlet for guys here. And, um, you know, I, I'm trying to look for different ways to, uh, to kind of sort through the madness, man. So, um, what, what's running through your mind when you're doing these workouts with no music or anything like that? And how often are you doing it? Uh, well, you know, I, like I said, I work out right now, I'm working out at a gym. Um, I, our, garage gym is, or sorry, garage is being, we tore it down and we're rebuilding it right now. So I'm in the gym more than I am in a garage. Um, so I'm kind of a lot of times just left with the, um, circumstances. If there's people already in the gym, they're playing music. I don't ask them to turn it off or anything, but if I'm in there by myself, um, I usually, you know, I don't turn on all the lights. I just turn on the lights in the area where I'm working out. Uh, it just kind of sets a nice stage for me to just kind of go at my pace, um, work through the things that I want to work through. And, you know, whether that's, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel like I have a lot of, uh, PTSD stuff related to firefighting. I don't, I don't think that that's the case for me. I, I feel like I do a pretty good job of unpacking that stuff, um, processing it, knowing, you know, what I could have done better, uh, but, you know, I, I don't have a job like you guys do. I think, you know, you guys got it rough, man. I, I see on a daily basis, we work with uh, North Glen PD uh, in the North suburbs and watching those guys now make the changes that, you know, are obviously they needed to be made um, and having them struggle with some of those changes is really, it's a tough job. I mean, not only do they have to, you know, control a, a, uh, a person, but they have to do it safely. They have to take that person into consideration and, you know, uh, are they approaching that scenario with the, uh, the right amount of care and respect for the, the human being? Um, it's tough, dude. I, I don't know how you guys do it because, you know, it's a, not only with the, the time and the place that we're in right now, but just the daily interactions of not knowing where it's going to go. That's, it's, uh, it's luckily, you know, for firefighting, they will, People want us to be there generally, <laughs> you know, whereas the PD, oh, yeah. uh, you guys, you guys are the heroes, man. It's like, you know, we pull up and it's like, oh shit, you know, the fuzz is here. But, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, we took the job knowing that that was going to be part of the process. I, just, I never thought I'd be where, where I am right now in my career and what I'm seeing, but you know what ebbs and flows, that's what life is. You have to go with the bad and you got to understand that, you know, yeah. you know, you could, you could be a hero one day and then, you know, you blink and you're a villain. So, you know, that's just the nature of the beast when you, you know, when you're on this side of the first responder realm. So, you know, you got to take everything in try. Yeah. It's interesting. I, th you know, I, again, I'm not in that scenario. I, I'm not in your shoes, but like, I feel like, um, if, if you approach most situations with this person is not a threat to me, they're a threat more to themselves and I'm, I need to care for that person. That's usually the, the scenarios where people respond the best to us. You know, like, let's just say we have somebody that's intoxicated that PD wants transported because they're a threat to themselves or somebody else. You know, we subdue, uh, uh, we, we put somebody on a pram, we uh, uh, isolate each of their, their extremities, uh, you know, Velcro them down. And usually if you just talk to somebody, be like, man, what's going on with you? you know, and, and not be uh, re real, you know, alpha male with them. Uh, it seems that that de-escalates the scenario a little bit. And I understand that, you know, PD has, has to keep their guard up because who knows if somebody's just going to come around the corner, that's this guy's buddy and loses shit and do something while you're not even seeing them. 
but I found that just for me as a firefighter, that if I just try to approach things like with an understand, or like try to understand before I make a judgment on the person, it, it usually ends up uh, working out a little bit better. Usually, I'm not saying always. Empathy, and that head empathy. Yeah, point. It's, it, it's hard to have that though when you're burned on it so often. Yeah, that's you know you're looking at this person as a person, and not not starting the conversation. Hey, asshole, come over here and let me talk to you. You know, that's right away. You know, and um, that's why the rep for responders was all created because you know thirty. You said thirty. You said it. Um, thank God you don't have, you don't have you don't suffer from that. But thirty percent of first responders, and it's probably higher, suffer from some type of PTSD, anxiety, depression, um, and the emotional survivor skills for a lot of first responders are not not there. You know, they're not aware of a lot of this, or they're ignoring it. You know, they're they're stuck in the labyrinth, or they're in in the pain cave, right, Matt? And um, yeah. you know, creating the program, the free open gym, the the Zoom support sessions, this podcast is to create a different mindset for them emotional survivor skills it's okay to not be okay for a little bit but it's not be it's not okay to ignore it and pretend nothing is wrong so now we have this program where everything's going on in the streets you learn some of these skills you can make better decisions on the streets you can make the right call you don't have to go through something you, 228 police suicides last year 57 That's is good. the average age of a cop you know these are things that can be changed with small little steps as in Listen to a podcast, talking on a podcast, going to the gym, making little small changes throughout your daily life. That's going to add up to, oh man, I'm really fatigued, and I just shot someone when I I I, I didn't I didn't mean to, or you know, make the wrong arrest. You know, you're able to be more aware, and that's what we're trying to be here is to 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 make the world a better place to lift, live, and think in. You know, for first responders and everybody. Um, and I got a pretty. It, you, I, I think our listeners are going to uh, love to hear this from you because uh, I had, uh, I don't know if you know Bill Grundler. He's like the owner of CrossFit Inferno uh, in yeah. California and, and stuff. So I just had him on uh, two, two days ago and he's a retired fire, uh, fire captain. And he said the exact same thing you did, man. And I'm like sitting here smiling. He's like talking about he's 53 or 51. He said that he brought up the 30 year old bill compared to the 50 year old bill and the ego had to be destroyed. It ha he had, um, something you know kind of a lot of craziness going on in his life with his with his his family his job and he said if he didn't kind of go through what he went through and catch the ego and destroy it mm -hmm. he wouldn't be here where he is today now is there a point in your life now i don't know if 2014 was a change for you like you know it probably definitely was uh, when you got injured if it changed your mindset and made you sit back in the chair and look at the, the movie screen of matt but is there a way of conscious matt able to catch those egotistic Matt thoughts and kind of put them on a, put them on a plate and go from there. Like, can you just kind of describe when you caught that ego change, when you said, you know, your ego back in the games was great, was, was big. And then you kind of were able to, is it catch those thoughts where ego Matt was talking versus really the person, the spiritual Matt Chan of who you really are. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think back in the day, you know, it was, it was different because, you know, I was teaching a lot. I was teaching CrossFit. I was teaching competition stuff and people looked to, you know, and I taught the competition stuff with Chris Spieler and a guy named Eric O'Connor and Spencer Hendel. And these are very high level guys. And these people uh, that were at the seminars looked to us for information and for our opinions on things. So I, in effect, was rewarded for having an opinion on everything. And unfortunately, what happens when you have an opinion on everything is that you think your opinion is the right opinion. And again, that inflates your head, that inflates uh, your sense of uh, self-worth and, and all of that stuff. Um, but when, when I look back at some of my answers and think about some of the interactions I had with people, they were very poor interactions. And it was not because of the person I was talking to, but it was because of my opinion and my approach to uh, interactions with that person. So I think what I try to do now is that, you know, I think a great leadership quality is letting a person thrive, just, you know, letting a person um, figure out their own stuff. And if they ask for guidance, you can work with them on that stuff. But for the most part, you know, I, I like to approach things for myself as like, okay, I don't know how to do this, whatever the task is or whatever the skill is, I don't know how to do it. Um, so instead of pretending like I'm, I know how to do it or, um, not doing it at all because I don't want to fail, I want to actually do it 
and be a beginner and look like a beginner and make mistakes like a beginner because that humbles me and that makes me feel like I'm just one of the guys. I suck at this just like everybody else does. And I have something to learn from somebody who might even have less time on the, on the department than I do. And maybe they learned something in the academy that was, you know, different from what I learned. And holy shit, that's so much easier. And I think when people um, learn from each other, they, they gain a, self, uh, a mutual self-respect and then ego isn't necessary. And in my interactions with people, that, that seems to be the best way to approach things. So now I try to avoid, uh, I try to avoid uh, scenarios where it's me teaching something. I don't, I don't like that anymore because it's actually, I think that's the, it, it gets me back in that mindset where it's like, no, 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 no. The way that you're doing it is wrong. The way that I'm talking about is like this and that's right. And that, that starts to inflate the ego. And I'm not going to lie, you know, being on the Titan games and winning that, um, uh, that competition and getting, you know, more uh, like requests for podcasts and more attention in, in like newspapers and stuff like that. It has set me up for potentially having that ego jump back into my life. So I have to really to be, a, yeah, I really have to be aware of it right now and try to be as humble as possible. And, and one thing that really helps is just gratitude and being thankful for all these opportunities that I'm getting right now and, and listening. Man, that was, I love that. <laughs> Jay, I mean, you can sit here and smile and because I love it. And it brought me back to another podcast we had on Monday with Navy Steel, Jeff Nichols. He said the exact same thing you said. He said he, he couldn't do the hands-on training as in, um, active shooter training, the skydive, this, the, all the hands-on stuff. He said he just – he was done. He couldn't do it anymore. He didn't elaborate as much as you did, but he, he said he, he loves and lives more for the mental training now, the emotional skills, the more of uh, training, more of weights than actually training cops and stuff and, and, and military on more scenario type base, more of, I guess – life skills in life that you can use not just for that scenario do you know what i mean so yeah that, um, i'm happy you were, you brought that up because it can really bring you back to a place and and now you're able to catch it like you just said you're you're catching that you're catching that coming back you know that the shadow of matt kind of creeping back up on i'm saying you know oh wait a second and what all the skills you've learned with you know ryan holiday and all these different things and that's the beauty of life um and growing is catching things that you might have not been able to catch in the past. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's uh, Ryan holiday. That book is just one example, but there, there's a million of them out there that people can identify with, you know, uh, as old as it is, the, the seven habit habits of highly effective people with, uh, by Stephen Covey is something that I read in 2006 and I keep reading because just those seven habits, if you, if you apply them in your daily life, it will make you a better person. And, like you said, it gets out of control from time to time and you lose focus and you let your ego get the best of you. And luckily I have a wonderful wife that is willing to tell me like, Hey, just chill out just a little bit. You know, you're, you're, you're making this about you. It's not about you. It's about, it's about us or it's about, you know, I, I heard this interaction that you had with this person and I don't think that came out the way you wanted it to. So just be aware of it. And she, she and I approach that as a team because she knows I'm dealing like that. That's something that um, makes me uh, unhappy is like let, knowing that my ego gets out of control and she'll tell me, she'll be like, Hey, just, just so you know, I, I can see this happening again. So just take a breath, spend some time, think about it and, and it'll make you better. So it's important to have that structure, that support structure yeah, too, you know, and you need to have somebody around you to make sure they hold you, you're, that you're holding yourself accountable and, you know, we're, we're human. We make mistakes and sometimes we don't, you know, uh, realize that that's happening. So, um, you know, it's great to have that person there to kind of reel you back in there. So I think it's yeah, it is. That. The, the four agreements too. Did you ever read that book, Matt? Have you ever heard no. of that? The four agreements. I think you'll, yeah, you'll, that is a you'll love phenomenal that man. Book. Okay. That might change. That's going to be a good, that's, it's a great one. And it's not a long read either, man. Uh, definitely take take a look into that. Yeah, and, super, uh, quick. super quick. Yeah, that's... I just finished that one up in um, October. Yeah, and the, the the Ryan Holiday kind of brought me to uh, 
kind of how the, how this podcast came about uh, by uh, an author called Jason, uh, Joseph Campbell, a hero of a thousand faces. And it talks about myth and mythology. And that's where, you know, I, I got so attracted to the story of the labyrinth and the minotaur and thesis. And then you put yourself into each perspective um, that it is just, you, you take these little stories or these myths and even the King Arthur and, and going into the cave and the, and the deepest dark, the deepest dark part of the forest. And you're able to relate that to, to real world situations. I mean, what, without that, I, this podcast would have never been created, you know, like the, the labyrinth is your mind and, you know, you know, <clears throat> back, I don't know if you know anything about Greek mythology or follow any of the stories or anything, but every little story like that in mythology has a point in for us for the hero we're the hero you know and we're either going to make it out or we're not and you know uh thesis is the greek warrior and that you know he's strength confidence uh the visionary you know and the minotaur back then in, in greek in greece was killing all the great warriors and thesis pictured you know what i can kill the minotaur i know i can do it I go in the labyrinth kill him but the only thing was how was he going to get out of the labyrinth he was scared and afraid of once I kill him, am I going to get stuck in the labyrinth and can't go out? And his girlfriend at the time, your wife, gave him a little ball of yarn. The smallest little thing, right? Very cheap. When you enter the labyrinth, drop the yarn down. You're going to kill the, the minotaur and just follow the yarn back out. And that's what happened. So the minotaur is also you, your fear, your doubt, your anxiety. You know, he's always coming on your neck, breathing. And that's where we're also thesis. But we also need that little compassion and love to make it through this life. You know, and I'm really yeah, great. great on that on sharing these stories and you can't do this alone, man. If you think you could do this alone, this life you've already lost, you know, at half the battle, half the battle is, is lost as a cop. You can't do this alone as a firefighter. You can't fight a fire alone. You know, you need that guy behind you on the hose. You need that, that you two searching and clearing the room. You know, it's, it just makes life a lot simpler. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and I always ask this question too. It's just a question we always ask. Um, with, with everyone that comes on the show is alcohol and training and alcohol in your life. Did you ever have a problem with it? Did you ever do you use it? Or, you know, you've probably seen a lot of guys firehouse or not kind of crumble from, from, from it. Uh, well, I, I don't, I, I have, you know, obviously recreationally used alcohol, you know, here and there over the years, but I, I don't drink. I, I don't even know if I've had uh, a, a glass of any form of alcohol in 2020. So it's just not a big, it's never been a big part of my life. It doesn't make me feel good. And um, I do think that personally, uh, alcohol, it, you know, it prohibits a lot of the, the gains, if you will. Um, so that's my primary reason. You know, I do use uh, a little THC. Uh, our department does permit it. Um, it there's a, there's a, a DOT level that we, that we have to adhere to. And I make sure that you know, my use of it is on my 10 day vacations um, and stuff like that so that I don't have to worry about getting popped, uh, you know, to be above that limit while I'm on duty. Um, because I certainly don't use it anywhere near when I am going on duty because the testing is not as adequate as it is for alcohol, where it's what's in your bloodstream right this second. You know, THC can stick around anywhere from like five days to 30 days. So I definitely don't use it in the frequency that, um, that, uh, you know, a lot, uh, you know, many people do get, you know, use substances. Um, and then I, I, there are some other elements of, uh, things that have really helped me out, um, in the past, uh, and even right now, um, you know, mind altering stuff, if you will, that, that have helped me, you know, focus on what I need to improve in, in my life. And that, that stuff has been, instrumental in seeing myself from a different perspective. Um, so I don't use alcohol, but I, but I do admit that I, you know, I, I enjoy a couple of other things here and there, but I see, I see what alcohol does to some of the guys I work with, you know, yeah, some of them do have problems. I'm a problem in our, in our field. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less of you, Matt, yeah. like a solid stand up guy. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. So we normally do this little, uh, like, um, round Robin almost, uh, at the end of uh, every podcast. Right. So Frankie comes up with these questions, but I'm going to kind of toggle in here a little bit. Right. Does Matt Chan have a Matt Chan bar from Rogue? Yes, I do. Absolutely. And I knew it. I knew it. And it's, and it's <laughs> badass. It's badass. Funny story about that. So, um, the way that the, the Matt Chan bar from Rogue Fitness came, 
came about was uh it was probably like 2000 it was probably like 2012 um and bill henniger the owner of rogue fitness took me over mm -hmm. to their facility their manufacturing facility where they make their barbells and okay. he was really he was really ex uh, excited about this new process that they had and uh he he wanted to show it to me so i drove over there with him in his truck and uh we got to talking with one of the guys who was um putting the bars together and he was like you know i was asking him could you do this could you do this could you do this to make the bar a little bit different and the guy was like yeah you could do all of that stuff easily um and then Bill was like, do you want to, to create a bar real fast? And I'll leave you here and I'll come back at the end of the day and you can have a bar that you've created. And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I made the modifications to their standard Rogue bar um, that I like with barbells. Um, and some of the stuff had never done, been done before. So I don't okay. know where the patent process uh, is right now with those guys, but I know that they were applying for a patent on the, the Matt Chan uh, bar. Um, oh, you know, some of the, yeah, some of the stuff that's on it is completely unique to any other barbell uh, being made. So, so what are the differences? Uh, so the standard Rogue bar or Ohio bar has the same uh, neural depth uh, all the, uh, across the board. They're the, they're the okay. same which I really like in a bare steel bar. Um, but when they put the black oxidized coat on it or Cerakote even on it, it fills in that, that depth of the neural a little bit, making the bar a little slippery in high rep situations like you know power snatches or clean and jerks or deadlifts. Okay. So I wanted a little bit more neural depth on the outside neurals, okay? okay. Um, I also, it drove me crazy that I have, you know, I, I've got a bunch of tattoos on my legs, but on both sides of my legs, I've got a racing yeah. stripe where, where yep. all the, yep. all the ink's been torn out because of the neural. And <laughs> so you guys probably do the same thing. If, if you're benching or if you're deadlifting, you guys line your thumbs up on the bar. Yes, sir. Right at the end of the neural. Right. And then you, and then you yep. grab it right there. So I just mm -hmm. took that, that thumb distance out. There is no uh, neural there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So for those of us that are like into CrossFit, like you can grab it's onto smooth, the bar. So it's, it's smooth. It's smoother. It's smooth. Right? It's smooth where your thumb would be, where there's normally neural. That's so you take I'm out getting the match hand bar, bro. That's it. It's done. Yeah. It's done. I need that. I need that. And then they, they also, most of their barbells, they don't put uh, a center neural on. And mm -hmm. I love it. I love a center neural, but I also don't love those neurals that leave a raspberry, you know, on your, on your neck. Yep. yep. So, that center neural that I put on that bar is like one tenth of the depth of their normal rogue bar. So like you could, you can roll your finger over it and it's pretty much smooth, but it'll stick to your shirt on the front and the back. And that's really what I was looking for. Ah, ingenious, my man. I like that. I got to add 15, it adds 15 pounds to every, everyone's lift. So you that's right. to sell you're going gonna to PR immediately as soon as you get yeah. it. So. <laughs> I need to know, um, all right, so your best clean and jerk, your best snatch, and your best deadlift. Okay, best clean and jerk uh, was probably like 2015, and I think I was at 350. My best snatch was 305, and that was 2015. And uh, my best deadlift was actually this last year uh, at the combine for the Titan Games. That was one of the things that they tested. And I think I pulled 485. I'm sorry, 585. 585. 585. Yep. Those are those are some legit numbers, dude. <laughs> Thanks. That three that 350 uh, cleaner jerk is no joke, man. And that 305 snatch. Uh, that is uh, that is a very terrifying lift. Um, uh, I've gone to 285, and I'm just like, you know what? I don't even want to know what 300 feels like. Uh, yeah. Because just just having that overhead, man, and it's like you know one wrong move, a miscalculation kind of scares me a bit. So that 305 is super respectable. That 350 is very respectable. Yeah. Um, the, the, is, is the deadlift like your, your favorite movement? Like what's your favorite movement as far as like, I mean, any movement you could choose in the world, what would you choose that you could do uh, every day? If I could do it physically every day, um, I think the, uh, I think probably what I get the most out of is a back squat. 
Um, but uh, unfortunately, yeah. man, it messes with my knees if I do it in mm -hmm. uh, high high loads. So um, I really love it. But honestly, the the one movement that I think I could not live without um, is probably uh, just a, a, a rower. Like I love rowing. I feel like whether it's high intensity or whether it's low intensity, the rower is just, it's my movement. I, I really just enjoy sitting on a rower. How do you feel about the bike erg? Love the bike erg. Um, I, I actually rode a mountain bike race last year called the Leadville 100. It's a hundred miles uh, of mountain biking above 10,000 feet in elevation. Uh, oh my God. The, yeah. The highest point of that one was over 12,000 feet. Um, so l absolutely legitimate, uh, big endurance event, which I have zero endurance background whatsoever. So I reached out to Chris, uh, Chris Hinshaw, um, mm -hmm. from aerobic, aerobic capacity. And he built me a bike erg program that I did two days per week. And I did one mountain bike, uh, long distance, but at a very easy pace one day per week. So three days a week of mountain biking or of biking. And uh, I did all the training on the bike erg and it was when I went and did the Leadville 100, it was just, it just felt natural. It was no big deal. Uh, all right. I got it. Cause I just got a bike erg and, uh, and, I'm, and uh, I just was on it before I started podcasting here and uh, it's tearing me up, but it, it, it's definitely helping. Uh, Cause we have one uh, here at the gym. Send me an email and I'll, I'll send you that bike erg program. You'll, you'll fucking yeah, love it. So I was about to ask you if I could send you an email and do that. I will definitely send you an email. Yeah. It's a, it's 24, I think it's 24 workouts and I've, I've done them where I've just gone through them and again and again, and those 24 workouts, they're, they're about an hour each, maybe even an hour and a half on some of them. Perfect. And okay. it's a long time, but it's good. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it, man. I got it in the house now. So this is going to be great. I can turn on the TV or maybe just get some tunes going and I can go. Exactly. Frank, yeah, I know you got some yeah, questions. Matt yeah, Frank, you over there smiling. Matt, Matt already answered the question. Yeah, Matt, we usually ask these random questions to like get the listeners to know you a little bit more. <laughs> but we always ask if you had one lift to do for the rest of your life every day, what would it be? And it was it was a squat. Was it would it be high bar or low bar? A uh, high bar squat. Yeah, I think uh, high bar, high bro. Bar. He's a crossfitter. High bar, bro. Crossfitters high bar. Power lifters low bar. Frankie, we know these things, man. Yeah, yeah you never know how he, how he's feeling. My and, big thing with, we, the, with the low bar or with the high bar back squat is that uh, it, it just gets a little more flex in the ankle and the knee. And I think that's good for joint health. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why I like the high bar. It's not because I don't think the low, low bar is not legitimate or anything like that. I think it's a great movement and it'll probably PR your back squat. Yeah, yeah. It definitely. Yeah. What's, your, what's your back squat, dude? Uh, my best ever was, uh, I think it was like 465. But now, honestly, like, been having knee issues for probably about seven, eight months now. Um, I'm just rebuilding. I'm, I just PR'd at 205 pounds uh, okay. on a on a single, and it was pain free. So I just stopped there. It felt heavy. So hopefully, I can work that thing back up to like the mid 300s, and I'll be happy with that. Yeah, I'm running around on a torn meniscus right now, so I feel your pain, bro. Yeah, yeah. It's just, um, sometimes it's not worth it, right? It's just the yeah. swelling and all that. Yeah. It's just like. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, and the mental headache getting there when you're, you know, that's and, and I want to bring that up too, Matt. Is you just hit, you just said it yourself. A two hundred five is a PR for you, not ever, but it's a PR for Matt right now. And people need to be accountable for that. And remember, you know, you're coming off an injury, and this is what you're able to do right now. And you're slowly going to be able to creep back up, like you said. You're not, oh fuck, man, I was able to do four sixty five. I'll never get there. And you know, people, you have to realize people need to think about it like this. You got a lot of, if you're a busy person, you got a lot of shit going on in your real life, you know, that affects you, your, 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 your nervous system, your brain, your, your muscles, everything. So people need to remember, you know, maybe that old person, that old Matt, that old Matt Frank is, is gone. This is what you're working with now. Let's move forward and, and try to hit PRs right there. So, uh, um, you know, yeah, thanks so for bringing that, time, that mindset up, Matt, you know, every time I, uh, decide it's time to run through some sort of development of some capacity, whether it's a squat or bench press or um, even a running capacity. Um, I always start with a, a program with a test and then I retest at the end of it. So like, you know, when I tested my, my back squat for this program that I've just been doing, I think my pain-free weight was 95 pounds. Wow. Literally wow. right above that. It was like my knee swelled. Uh, it, it, it was like, 
it buckled. It felt like it was like eight out of 10 pain. So I was just like, you know what? It's 95 pounds right now. That's what it is. And then you move forward from there, right? Yeah. Humble Humble. warrior, Matt Shannon. Exactly. I like it. Samurai. Um, And don't forget to roll out your ankles, people. That's, you know, a lot of people forget about the ankles and the lacrosse ball and stretching them. I mean, a lot of people, you know, I'm a firm believer. It starts in your ankles, moves up to your hamstrings, move up to your lower back. And the ankles are such a huge key component that people don't even know about. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad you brought that up, Matt, for that. Yeah. Um, if you have one meal to eat for the rest of your life every day, unhealthy or healthy, what, what are you going with? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I really love breakfast. I got this breakfast <laughs> thing that I do every single day. But uh, yeah, I think number two on the list would probably be uh, uh, the uh, – do you guys have Papa Murphy's pizza out there? Hell no. It's like a, no, okay. Papa Murphy. Papa, yeah, never Papa heard of who? Papa Murphy. No, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the here's the funny part. So, like, I, I'm from Chicago, and I love deep dish pizza. And, you know, obviously, I'd say, you know, going out to Lou Malnati's or something like that would be my my go to. But there's a there's a really convenient take and bake place called Papa Murphy's in Colorado, and they make one that's like a Chicago style, and it's awesome. So I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with Papa Murphy's Chicago style. Gotcha. There you go. Two, yeah, now we got two two uh, the Bears fans on here. We had Eddie Cohen and 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 now Matt Chan. So right from Chicago, baby. We're making Eddie fun of Bear. Mike Dicka. Oh, yep. I have a question. Um, most most painful tattoo, Matt, because you got a lot of ink. Oh uh, man, I just got my knee. Uh, so I I finally finished both knees. I and just this week I just finished the my right knee and. Uh, <laughs> It's pretty boot. Uh, how about this? The answer is the last one you got. <laughs> fa- fa- favorite movie or two, if it had to come to your mind. What's uh, the Big Lebowski, here? definitely number one. Um, okay. okay. Like yeah, that. and then uh, 13 Assassins, probably number two. Uh, oh, that's, a that's a good great one. samurai movie. I love samurai flicks, and that's like a kind of a modern era sa- samurai flick that I think everybody needs to see because it's so good. Yeah, I, I was wondering why you have like the samurai thing on the uh, on the bar. I was really into samurai movies at the time. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right, all right, I figure it out, bro. <laughs> yeah. Someone just said, was it was it Jeff Nichols who said the last samurai with Tom Cruise? Were, were, were we there for yeah, that, Jason? The right? he, yeah. Yeah, and, that. yeah. Um, favorite movie. Um, you have you come to New York, right? Me and Jay are chilling. Like, yo, Matt, we got this time machine. You get you're able to go in anywhere you want. Twenty years ago, two hundred years ago, as a Matt, you are now. Which time frame are you going to? Ah, oh, man. You know what would be cool uh, to go back to like the late '60s, early '70s to experience climbing in the heyday of when climbing was, uh, rock climbing that is, uh, was just the the boundaries were being pushed every day, every climb. And there was so much uh, rock out there that nobody had ever touched that every day was an adventure. So I think that would be really cool. I think that I'd like to experience that. That is a first, no one's ever said anything like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, and, and I didn't even know that that's when it started. So that's, that's, something to look up look up and and see that's cool uh yeah. one person to meet dead or alive to hang out with who are you picking uh well uh, so this is funny it's kind of the the same deal i think uh leighton core who is a uh who was an adventure climber back in uh late 50s early 60s um he just pushed the boundaries so much of not only what was capable at the time he was a very tall lanky dude and he was climbing stuff that people still consider classics right now. The best climbs in the world are usually latent, latent core climbs. Um, but he also, he lived this lifestyle that was just so admirable. He, he, uh, he worked for a short period of time throughout the year and then he traveled around in his car, just scouting out rocks that had never been climbed before. He'd climb them and then he'd move on to the next one, rarely repeating a, uh, a climb. He would just generally just, try to put up a first ascent one after another on these humongous towers. And he's just a dirt bag. And I just, the, the yeah. bravery must take to just say, this is going to be my life better or worse. And this is what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I think that's pretty yeah, cool. Pretty, so I'd like to yeah, like to pick his brain. Pretty badass. Bo Jackson too. That'd be pretty badass. Oh, Bo. Bo Jackson. Oh, that'd be one of yeah. yeah. Uh, 
last question. Um, we haven't asked this, but I'm interested to hear what you're going to say, Matt. So sorry to put you on the spot. If you can go back in time um, and one sent one sentence or two, I'll give you two to say to 13 year old Matt, what are you saying? Uh, that was good. Um, <laughs> it was my creepy laugh. <laughs> I'd say, I, I'd say, uh, this is what I would say. Dad is right. Anything in moderation. That's uh, I like that I didn't, a lot. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't catch on. I mean, my dad always said it when I was growing up. He'd be like, "Hey, hey," you know. I'd come home like w super drunk, you know, something like that. <laughs> and he'd be like, he'd look at me, and be like, "What the hell is wrong with you? Just every, just moderation, just fucking moderation, all right?" <laughs> and there we go, people. Moderation, Matt. Uh, thank you so much, man. It was a pleasure for you know having you on and meeting you and. Uh, and learned a lot and you know i just want to thank you very thank much. thank you frank thank you jay appreciate you oh, guys man. both in. thank you what, just, you, what you guys are doing to... is great so thank you so much I, I just want to personally say this man thank you for taking this interview uh this is like uh this is one of my bucket list things bro i got one of my uh crossfit guys uh on, a, on an interview um frank is, is able to make this happen so i just want to personally thank you uh you're one of the guys that i look up to in the sport um keep doing what you're doing keep fighting a good fight and uh i appreciate everything you do man Thank you, guys. Yeah, and thank you for your service. Again, my name is Frank. You guys know where to find me, at reps underscore four underscore responders. And my man, Jay, the one and only. Where can I find you? I am the one and only, the real jump man, Jay. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. That's where I'm mainly at. Um, Matt, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at Matt1Chan or on trainftw.com. Uh, I sell a program out there that I think is the best for first responders. It's called Thrive. Um, and it's 15 bucks a month. Uh, if you're unhappy with it, just email us back if you paid for a month and we'll, we'll refund your money because I guarantee you're going to absolutely fucking love it. And it's everything that we all just talked about today that, you know, things that I do now and how I keep my body healthy and, and also keep size on and stuff like that. It's, we, we put it all up there. There's videos for everything. So if you don't know how to do it, there's scaling options. So I'm really proud of it. Oh, so thank you. Wow. Hey, be, be ready to hear from me, bro. <laughs> I definitely need that. Okay, hit me up, and I'll, I'll make sure you guys get a get a membership. All right, brother. Yeah, Thank you, man. I'll, def I'll definitely look into that. I'm actually excited to to see what the whole program's about. We'll be right posting on. that. So, again, thank you, man. And uh, as always, we do a little thumbs up picture at the end. So, um, or whatever you want to do, you can flip us off if you didn't like it. <laughs> and there we go. Again, season four is in the books, Matt. Thanks for everything, brother. You have a great day. Thank you, guys. Hell of a day to have a hell of a day. So, okay. Let's get Take it. Take care, guys.